Welcome back to our Bible study as we are in the last chapter of our study, the book of John. Since we are approaching <clears throat> the end of the year, there are not many announcements other than in two weeks, we will have our end of the year fellowships coming up. So please plan ahead and come out next year will be another amazing BSF study. So please, over the summer, invite your friends and family to get them signed up through the BSF website so we can start preparing for next year's study. There's one more thing I wanted to mention. I got a look at BSF's three-year look ahead, and we have a brand new BSF study coming up in two years. Next year is Revelation, but the year after that will be the third part to the people of the promised land, which will be which will be the books associated with the exile to Babylon, like Daniel and Ezekiel, <clears throat> and the books associated with the return trip back home, like Ezra and Nehemiah. BSF does a great job of putting these biblical studies together for us. So something to look forward to. But now let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have graciously invited us to study your word this year through the book of John. Your truth has enlightened us and challenged us along the way as we have sought to have a closer, closer and deeper relationship with you. But now strengthen our inner man so we can in internalize your word in our hearts. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get going today, I got a fishing tale I'd like to share. I grew up in a fishing family where I learned how to fish soon after learning how to walk. As a little kid with my plastic rod and my Zebco reel, I quickly learned how to catch hundreds of perch from the dock. Because of this background, I'm tempted at times to get a little overconfident in my fishing abilities. Well, several, several years back, my father-in-law and I traveled to Victoria Island to salmon fish in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. That day, the weather was beautiful, and it was salmon season, and we couldn't wait to get out on the water. When we were driving back to the dock, <clears throat> or driving to the dock, my father-in-law and I were already dreaming about and counting all the fish we were going to catch that day. When we got to the dock, it was in the morning, but there were already guys getting off the boats with armloads of salmon. My father-in-law and I were high-fiving each other, saying, we're going to crush it today. As we motored out to the fishing grounds, the water was calm. Bald eagles were flying. It was a day to catch salmon. So I thought. We fished, and we fished, and we fished all day long. Not only did we not catch a fish, but we didn't even get a bite, not even a nibble. Now, when you fail at something that you think you're good at, it shakes your confidence to your core, makes you question yourself. Remember when the disciples were asking, who would be the greatest in the kingdom as they jockeyed for position amongst each other? Well, because of everything that happened in Jerusalem, they might have felt like they had failed as disciples, especially Peter. And so they waited for Jesus. So as they waited for Jesus, they thought they would return to something they knew they were good at. And that was fishing. And as we know, they failed to catch any fish until Jesus showed up. So our lesson today is divided in, into three divisions. Our first division is John chapter 21, verses 1 through 8 fishing with Jesus. In our second division, it's John chapter 21, verses 9 through 14, breakfast with Jesus. In our last division is John chapter 21, verses 15 through 25, walking with Jesus. As we get going in our first division, fishing with Jesus, please turn your Bibles to verse 1. Last week, we left off with the disciples in Jerusalem as Jesus revealed himself to the group, especially to Thomas. This week, John sets the setting right away with the disciples back in the Galilee area. It's been several chapters since the disciples were in the Galilee. The BSF notes this week have a highlighted section of Jesus's post 
resurrection appearances and the associated timeline. This is good information, and it helps us to understand the timeline better during this kind of limbo period between the resurrection and Jesus's ascension. Now, we have this handy outline, but the disciples didn't. Just think how they must have been feeling and how hard it would be to connect the dots, especially since they didn't have the Holy Spirit as given on the day of Pentecost. Now, the events in chapter 21 are not detailed in the other Gospels. And remember, the Gospel of John was written decades after the Synoptic Gospels. But the events in chapter 21 were part of the oral teaching of the church before John wrote it down. But it appears from verse 1, when John says, it happened this way, it seems that John is messaging to his audience that he has to set the record straight. That potentially some of the details were inaccurate. And now, towards the end of his life, he was clearing up any misunderstandings. As we move on to verse 2, it appears the disciples are hanging out in the Galilee together. And Peter decides to go fishing. And some of the disciples join him in this endeavor. The Bible doesn't reveal to us what Peter's motives were to go fishing, but it could have been as simple as passing time until they received their next instructions from Jesus. Now, let's turn to the passage and start reading at verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Even though Peter has been officially, has not been officially restored by Jesus, it appears that the other disciples, or at least six of them, follow his lead and go fishing. Now, these guys were previously professional fishermen, and they were back home, they were back on their home turf. And, and fishing is something the disciples were good at, but they failed. As John says, they caught nothing. While they were floating on the lake all night, throwing out their nets, coming up empty-handed, do you think any of them thought to pray? At some point, you think at least one of them would have. But we aren't told, so we can't speculate. We do know when morning dawned, their situation would change for the better. Now, let's turn back to the passage and start reading in verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Before we discuss the verses, can you imagine if Jesus was your fishing partner, always knowing the best places to throw out your line? From verses 4, John makes it clear that they did not initially recognize Jesus standing on the shore calling out to them. So it's interesting, why did the disciples obey the voice from the shore? Well, John doesn't clarify that point, but yet, Obedience to the command seems to be the point. They must have sensed something was unusual or authoritative in his voice, even though they could not discern his identity. But thankfully, they didn't ignore the voice, because if they had, the outcome would have been very different. Let's back up to verse 5 and take a closer look at it. In verse 5, Jesus calls them friends. The NIV uses the word friends, but the ESV and several other translations use the word children. Why is that? The Greek word used the um, the, the Greek word used is padion, which means young child. From the structure of the sentence in Greek, it anticipates a negative response. So you could think of it like this. So, boys, you haven't caught anything, right? 
By Jesus saying this, it forced the disciples to admit and recognize their failure, which will set up the miraculous catch in verse 6, which also expo exposes their need for Jesus in the following passages. Moving on to verse 7, let's read. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. I think there is a pattern that is starting to be revealed by John. We saw John invite Peter to the trial. Then it was John and Peter who raced to the tomb. And now we see John and Peter are the ones who react to the massive catch of fish. It's interesting that James, John's brother, is not highlighted in any of these appearances. Because of this, it has led some scholars to say John's gospel laid the groundwork to show that John was the successor after Peter's death to lead the church. Getting back to the passage, we don't know what caused John to recognize the Lord. Some say it might have been the previous large catch of fish when Jesus was calling Peter to follow him originally. From John's discernment in the tomb and now here on the boat, it does appear that John is a little more in tune to the Lord. But Peter, being a man of action, puts on his outer garment and jumps into the water to swim to shore. You got to love Peter's display of affection for Jesus. Now, Peter didn't say why he jumped in to swim towards Jesus, but potentially he recognized life without Jesus is empty and life with Jesus is better. And he wasn't willing to wait for the boat to paddle over. Which leads to our first principle, which is Jesus leads his followers to a better life. Jesus leads his followers to a better life. This passage is so timeless. No matter who you are, you can relate to failing at something that you thought you were really good at. And I'm sure the seven disciples thought fishing would be a nice break and would allow them to spend some time together doing something they were good at. But instead, they worked all night and they had to and all they had to show for their hard work was empty nets. I would think many of us have experienced working hard to only come up with the empty nets of life. We all need a gentle reminder of what Jesus said back in John 15. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This includes the stuff you used to be good at. So let me ask you, where do you need to stop striving and turn to Jesus in faith to bear much fruit? Where do you need to stop striving and turn to Jesus in faith to bear much fruit? As we move into the next division, breakfast with Jesus, please turn to verse 9. At this point, the boat is on shore, and the disciples are headed over to Jesus. Can you imagine walking up to the risen Lord? What would be the first things you would notice? Well, in verse 9, John tells us three significant details about the breakfast. But before we discuss it, let's read verse 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, there with fish on it and some bread. Burning coals, fish, and bread should cause all of us to reflect back when we have seen these before in the book of John. Jesus preparing a charcoal fire potentially was a literary allusion to Peter's failure in the courtyard around the charcoal fire. The fish and bread would potentially take the disciples back to when the Lord fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 with bread and fish. But I think it's significant that the Lord did all three things, which shows the Lord does not depend upon human effort to accomplish his will. And part of the Lord's will is to provide for our spiritual needs, 
as well as our physical needs in practical ways. Now let's move on to verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Now this is an interesting comment from Jesus. And what nugget of truth can we learn from, this, from the invitation? While the Lord can do all things without help from us, he invited Peter to contribute the fruit of his efforts. The Lord wants to enjoy the victory we accomplish together through him, not because he needs us, but because he loves us. As we move on to verse 12, did any of you find the wording of this verse a little out of the ordinary? Let's read verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Now, why would John include this detail? None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? This is speculation, but it seems almost like they didn't recognize his appearance, but they surely recognized his voice and his actions, which might speak to the differences between his old body and his resurrected body. Moving on, let's finish out this division in verse 13. <clears throat> Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Did you notice who's doing the serving in this verse? It's Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is serving these men. This is an amazing picture of our Lord in action. Jesus washed their feet before the cross, and now he's serving them breakfast after the resurrection which validates the verse, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, here in BSF, we try to share a meal when we have our fellowships. Now, why is that? Well, there is something profound about sharing a meal and breaking bread with others because it represents a deeper fellowship with one another. Which brings us to our second principle. Jesus desires to have fellowship with his followers. Jesus desires to have fellowship with his followers. In this passage, Jesus met the disciples where they were, approached them through things they understood, and provided for their needs as he revealed himself to them. When Jesus said to the disciples, come have breakfast with me, it was directed to them, but also for all of his future disciples. Jesus desires to do life with his disciples in the mundane and the amazing parts of life. We've been called into fellowship with him. I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let me ask you. What prevents you from daily communing and fellowshipping with Jesus? What prevents you from daily communing and fellowshipping with Jesus? As we move into our last division, walking with Jesus, please turn to verse 15. There's another scene shift. The disciples have finished breakfast, and now it's time for Jesus to reconcile Peter formally back into his previous position. In this section of scripture, I like to think of Peter like an athlete that is in a slump. And so what do you do when you have a really good athlete that can't break out of a slump? Well, you take him back to the basics. And that's what it seems like Jesus does when he calls him Simon, son of John. Remember, Jesus had previously changed Simon's name to Peter, the rock. But now, Jesus takes him back before he was the rock, and he was Simon, the son of John. Jesus is intentionally and slowly restoring Peter. Jesus is not looking past Peter's denials. He's not letting him off the hook. But instead, he's taking him through a reconciliation process. Now, in the same sentence, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? What are the these referring to? 
there are not a lot of options. Either it's the disciples or it's the fish. Scholars disagree, but after reading their arguments, I think Jesus is referring to the other disciples. The reason being, Jesus wanted to take Peter back to the upper room where Peter had boasted of his loyalty above the other disciples. This is when Peter said the other disciples might fall away, but he wouldn't. In this situation, Jesus is gently exposing Peter's previous actions while slowly breaking Peter down. As we move deeper into the passage, the BSF notes do a good job of covering this conversation between Jesus and Peter. So I would encourage you to read your BSF notes since I won't cover it all in detail. Initially, it seemed like the conversation started around the campfire after breakfast, but according to verse 20, Jesus and Peter are now walking and talking, and it appears that John is following close behind. Remember back to John chapter 14 and 15, where Jesus said multiple times, if you love me, follow my commands. In verse 15 and through 17, Jesus asked Peter if he loves him. And when Peter affirms his love, Jesus gives Peter three commands as it related to caring for Jesus's flock, which were feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, and feed my sheep. Simply, Peter was to feed and care for the flock of Jesus. Remember back to John chapter 10, Jesus is the good shepherd and the door to the sheepfold, and we are his sheep and lambs. And now, as Jesus is appointed leader, Peter was to care for believers' believers' physical and spiritual needs, with an emphasis on spiritual needs. Since Matthew 4.4 makes it clear what kind of food Peter was to feed the sheep. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, in verse 18 through 22, Jesus tells Peter what type of death he would experience. And through this, Peter turns to John and asks Jesus, Lord, what about him? And so Jesus gives Peter two more commands, which are follow me and you must follow me. Sometimes we overcomplicate our service to the Lord, which causes us to lose focus. But to prevent this, we just need to keep our eyes on Jesus and follow him. Seems so simple, but sometimes we get our eyes on others when we need to focus on Jesus. Through the restoration process, Peter emerged from his failure, a transformed man who would lead the church. And through this process, we see a fundamental truth. God breaks us so that he can remake us. Now, I didn't talk about the Greek translation of the word love and how it relates to the conversation between Jesus and Peter. The notes cover it, and I don't want to just repeat the notes, but you might be a little surprised what the notes say. So please read your notes to gain a deeper understanding. Verse 23 is a little interesting. It appears the first century church had problems with the rumor mill as much as the 21st century church does. Let's read it. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die, but Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? It appears that some believers took Jesus's correction to Peter to mean that Jesus was coming back before John would die. They didn't necessarily think John would live a longer than normal lifespan, but instead they thought Jesus would return soon within John's lifetime. Let's turn back to the passage and read the last two verses, starting in verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. There are a couple of things to note about these verses. First of all, who is the we 
and verse 24. Like many issues that are not explicitly written in the Bible, they end up being debated by scholars. This is one of those issues. As mentioned before, it's believed that John wrote his gospel account towards the end of his life in Ephesus. If that is true, <clears throat> then the we are potentially the Ephesian elders who are validating and endorsing the integrity of John's writing. Remember, at this time, there were a lot of Gnostic books that sounded Christian, but weren't, that were being circulated throughout the Roman world. So it was probably important at that time for the most influential church to attest to the veracity of the book. Moving on to verse 25, John makes the point that he could have added a lot more in the book, but he intentionally didn't include more. He was purposeful in his selection about the events he included. He was not trying to write an exhaustive account. John paints a compelling portrait of Jesus's life as the son of God with the necessary detail for readers to conclude that Jesus was who he said he was. And by believing in his name, you may have eternal life. As we move on, a theme in this passage <clears throat> has been the restoration of Peter, which is a good segue into this week's BSF doctrinal focus, which is reconciliation. As you guys know, reconciliation is the process by which two parties at odds with each other are brought back together. Peter faltered when he denied Christ, but he still loved and desired to follow the Lord. Jesus recognized Peter's struggle and publicly restored Peter to renewed fellowship and a place of leadership for his kingdom. Peter is an example of our break in fellowship with God. Every human is born with a corrupted sin nature that alienates us from God which is the bad news. But the good news is all who trust in Jesus' sacrifice for their own personal debt of sin are reconciled to God. Their separation from God has been overcome forever. But what happens when someone doesn't see their need in reconciling with God? They fail to understand the depth and damage of their sin. And they miss an opportunity to have fellowship with God in this life and for eternity. And they are dead in their sins and will eventually face eternal judgment. Which brings us to our third principle, which is Jesus restores his wayward followers. Jesus restores his wayward followers. As we've learned this year, Jesus is the good shepherd. This passage is a beautiful picture of Jesus leaving the 99 and going after his wayward sheep. So even though at times we fail and are faithless, Jesus never stops being faithful and caring towards us. Even though Peter failed Jesus, Jesus loved him and sought to restore him. Peter ends up being an example to all of us. There are times we fail to keep our promises and deny what we know is true out of fear. Thanks be to God, there is forgiveness and restoration through Jesus. Without Jesus, there would be no reconciliation between man and God. And in this life, God gives us an opportunity to forgive and restore others as Christ's followers. So let me ask you, where is Jesus sending you to be an agent of reconciliation. Where is Jesus sending you to be an agent of reconciliation? As we wrap up today, the big idea for this chapter is God's provision for his people to do his work. God has graciously called us to participate in his plan of redemption. <clears throat> so even though we fail at times, which is no surprise to him, he still uses us to spread the gospel message to a dying and sinful world. And he graciously equips us and provides for us while he sends us out into the world to be fishers of men. 
Let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the high calling you have given us. Thank you for restoring us back to our service when we have failed to live up to our calling. We are glad that if we are obedient to your leading, our service to you will not result in empty nets, <clears throat> but will be an abundant life and fellowship with you until you take us home. In Christ's name, amen.